Yes. Hello, good morning, everyone, or good evening or afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, it gives me great pleasure to host this session and to, to chair this session today, um, Children and Schools. Um, so just a few reminders, as Rita said, this will be recorded. And then for the questions, so um, papers will be strictly 20 minutes and then 10 minutes for questions. And so for questions, if you just um, type your question in the chat and then I'll call on you and you can turn on your uh, microphone and your camera if you so wish afterwards. So without further ado, we'll go on to the first um, talk of the day, which is Ganjar Haramsaya and Satwiko Buriona um, at the National Agency for Language Development and Cultivation. And the title of their paper is Revitalization of Tobati Language, Preliminary Teaching and Learning Implementation and Advocacy for Endangered Language in the Jayapura City, Papua Province, Indonesia. Yes. I'm here. Okay. You can see my presentation. Yes. Okay. Um, good afternoon in Jakarta time. Greeting from Indonesia. Thank you for attending this room at this session. I would like to introduce myself first. My name is Apiko Briono from National Agency for Language Development and Cultivation, or we call it in Indonesian language is Badan Bahasa. Just information. Badan Bahasa is legal for educator in Indonesia under authority by Ministry of Education and Culture, Republic of Indonesia. Uh, in here, I'm supposed to be with my partner, but I want to apologize to all of you but that my partner was not able to attend this presentation because he has another important agenda in another place. And the title of my presentation is Revitalization of Tobati Language. Preliminary Teaching and Learning Implementation and Advocacy for Endangered Language in Jayapura City, Papua Province, Indonesia. Before I explain my presentation, I would like to play a short video so you can imagine what we have done in this program. Back to slide. Okay. Okay. Hopefully the video can be worked. So you can have an overview about my presentation is uh, in Indonesia, uh, revitalization is a part of language preservation program. We have five main programs of language preservation. Start from language mapping, language fertility research, conservation, revitalization, until registration. 
every language or in this case obat language can be revital revitalized after completing conservation activity like language mapping, language vitality research, and linguistic system development in phonology, morphology, syntax, and the writing system. So this is a long journey because every activity did it with a different researcher from year to year before. Tobati confirmed as language from language mapping activity in 1998. In the same year, language fertility research was executed with results that status of Tobati language is severely endangered language. In 2015, Badan Bahasa continue preserve Tobati language in conservation or creating linguistic system development in phonology, morphology, syntax, until writing system. After that, in 2019, Badan Bahasa revitalized Tobati language. Background of revitalization in Tobati, in Tobati Village. The background of this program is based on number one, central government built UT Fabrics in near Tobati Village. UT, UT Fabrics is iconic bridge in Jayapura City used to connect separate areas between Jayapura City and school cross country border pass. Yoteva Bridge not only shortcut the distance, but making the surrounding area, including Tobati Village, a new tourism spot in Jayapura City. This situation certainly makes an impact on Tobati language as local language in Tobati Village because this situation increasing local language contact, so Tobati language don't have positive attitude in their society. It can be seen when we make assessment and young generation cannot speak Tobati language but they still knowing Tobati vocabulary if their parent or old generation speak in Tobati language as a passive speaker. But the sad story is a girl old generation rarely use Tobati language because old generation more often use Indonesian language in daily life. And we ask to young generation in Tobati village why they not use Tobati language. So they answer that Tobati language difficult to learn. To learn. Besides that, parents not forcing their children to use Tobati language as a mother language because they think Tobati language not function in the in school or outside village or to work or many more occasions. Another background of revitalization in Tobati village. Uh, the good news is local government create a local content textbook, namely a Tobati language teaching book for beginners and published in 2018. This local content textbook is collaboration between Jayapura city government and language representative office in Papua province of Badan Bahasa for basic introduction to learn Tobati language. This textbook contain basic and culture vocabulary for beginners, dialogue, short sentence, song, and many more. And this textbook using two language, Indonesian and Tobati language to facilitate learners. The aim of Tobati language revitalization are one, advocacy language preservation for local government because the Evora city government has responsibility to preserving sorry, local language in their areas according mandate from the Indonesian law. Besides that, this program can be placed to implement teaching and learning Tobati language model. So parents or teacher in elementary school can adopt this model for future activity. Badan Bahasa, a central government in language regulator, only stimulate and contribute to promoting Tobati identity and culture, so local government knowing the important preserving language is. Okay. Language revitalization model in Indonesia. Badan Bahasa divided language revitalization into three models. One, revitalization using society-based model. Two, revitalization using community community-based model, and three, uh, revitalization using school-based model. In Tobati language, revitalization using the school-based model method because this uh, because children 
in Tobati, more respect to teacher in school than their parents. It can say that the children feel afraid with the teacher than the parent, so the program can be run smoothly if the instructor is teacher. Well, as you know, this program needs a high commitment from instructor. That's why we believe that school-based model more effective than other model in Tobati case. On other hand, in Tobati village don't have community, so revitalization cannot running using community-based model. Tobati language revitalization process have four steps. Step one, survey and coordination. Step two, teaching and learning Tobati language. Step three, showing teaching and learning implementation to local government and related stakeholders. Step four, signing of commitment memorandum or MOU. I will explain more every step in the next survey and coordination process. As you can see in the slide, first we surveyed to invest Tobati Elementary School to getting no information about the teacher and student condition, condition, especially about language use of Tobati language in school. Then we survey to Tobati to make assessment with Tobati young generation in there about their opinion of Tobati language. After that, we coordinating with local government, I mean the Pura City government, to asking about planning revitalization of Tobati language. Not only that, we also coordinating with expert speaker of Tobati language about our planning. At the end, this is process, we choose instructor participant until discuss about teaching and learning material. It calls this program we only be facilitator. Instructor must be from Tobati Society. Participant of revitalization obtained from grade 2 until 5 students of Impress Tobati Elementary School. While uh, language instructor are collaboration between expert speaker of Tobati language and class teacher in Impress Tobati Elementary School. Teaching and learning process was intensively carried out for three months like extracurricular activity once a week after survey and coordination process in order to preventing disturbing regular teaching and learning in the class. Language instructor taught Tobati language in the different way through spiritual song from the church, traditional dance, monologue, and theatrical drama based on Tobati language teaching book for beginner material. All activities spoken in Tobati language, so Tobati young generation who will be student in interest Tobati elementary school can learn Tobati language more fun than regular, than regular listen in the class. Nah, showing teaching and learning implementation. This step is important because the Apura City government as a local government or another related stakeholder can directly see that a Tobati young generation enthusiasts to learn Tobati language. Hopefully, after this Jayapur, after this, Jayapura city government can make action plan to preserving Tobati language more than activity in this revitalization program. Signing of Commitment Memorandum or MOU between National Agency for Language Development and Cultivation or Badan Bahasa and Jayapura City Government. MOU signing by one Head of Language Preservation Division from Badan Bahasa, two Vice Mayor of Jayapura City, three Impress Tobati Elementary School Principal, and four Head of Jayapura City Tourism Office. Content of Commitment Memorandum or MOU by Vice Mayor of Jayapura City written in five important points. Point one, Jayapura City government support all matters related to language preservation in Tobati village. Point two, Jayapura City government giving recommendation to use Tobati language in daily life. Point three, 
Jaya Prasiti Government considering to continue teaching and learning for Basti language in school as extracurricular be before become lesson in class in the future. Point four, Jaya Prasiti Government planning to create curriculum for Tobati language as lesson in the class. Goal of the Jaya City Government in, in this MOU is open lesson on local content in Tobati language at in place Tobati Elementary School. Okay, the result of revitalization process in Tobati Village. Okay. Uh, the result so that Tobati, Tobati revitalization process has a significant impact on education, social, and cultural aspect than before. In education aspect, it provides a little a learning model for teachers to educate students with Tobati language as a local language in Impress Tobati Elementary School area. In social aspect, it has a um, ability to change participant revitalization mindset to learning Tobati language. In the cultural aspect, it explores history and culture vocabulary that they don't know before. Challenge of Tobati language revitalization one consistent to advocating advocating for Tobati language to local government to preserve local language in the future to raise a positive attitude for Tobati language to the younger generation than Indonesian language or English three educate society to preserve and use the Tobati language along with its various value, norms, and custom. Okay, the last uh, further information about revitalization of Tobati language can be found in this link, but this book is article still written in Indonesian language. So if you are interested about this, please let me know and send me an email so I will translate the book and article about revitalization of Tobati language in Jayapura to all of you. I think that's all. Thank you for the opportunity and see you in another place. Great to see you all. Great. Thanks so much for that presentation and thank you so much for keeping perfectly to time. That was great. So I'm sure that there's lots of questions. So if anyone wants to put their question in the chat, or just say, I have a question and I'll call on you. Well, just to get the um, ball rolling, um, thanks so much for that presentation. Um, you said in one of the slides that um, Tabati is um, very difficult for children to learn. And I was yeah. wondering if you could give some more specific, if you could, now that you have time to give some specific examples of, of that. Okay, thank you for the question. And uh, the part of difficult to learn for the children is a uh, ling Tobati language is many consonants in its word. So uh, the children, uh, it's confusing mm -hmm. to speak. How it speak if the consonant is so many uh, in its word? But <laughs> but I cannot uh, specifically uh, pick it because it's uh, I forget about the word but the specific linguistic in Tobati language is uh, the one word is many consonant okay yes mm -mm. yes that yeah, yeah. That's very interesting. Um, so now, Simona Scurry, if you want to ask your question. Sorry, it's a bit complicated. <clears throat> Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, sorry, it's a bit complicated. I'm in a car. Um, it's, it was very interesting. So the question is, how many speakers were there before you started the program and now, I mean, in, uh, in how many years? Because I lost when you gave the date of starting point. So when you started the research and the program. Thank you. It was great. 
Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, I'm uh, doing this revitalization in 2019. So it's uh, two years ago. And the number of population in Pabati village is about 500 people. But I don't know uh, now um, the population is uh, increasing or decreasing. I think that's all. And comment? Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now, Manuel A.B. Bosch, if you want to ask your question. Manuel was supposed to be praising the materials. <laughs> oh, there's a question. Sorry, Oliver. Uh, the language not used in media. It's just used in school, uh, include, uh, including in extracurricular. And the society is not using the Tobati language in daily life. So they on, uh, only old generation that use Tobati language in daily life. And um, uh, Chaird, you had a question? Chaird, you're still muted, but... Um, mm -hmm. So Chaird's question is, is the language used in media? As I was answered. Oh. Yeah, I think Satwiko an answered uh -huh. that one. This is oh, Rita okay. again. Um, yeah. Oh. Okay. I, 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 can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, I, I was very um, pleased to, to, to hear your lecture. Very interesting. And my question is whether there have been um, people working in the past on the language. Are there, is there any documentation or are there recordings of the language? And do you work with that? And my other question was about the media, but I think you have answered that. Uh, documentation of the body language. Yeah, yes. yeah. Documentation. Historical documentation. You, might, you, you know, of course, that we have very important historical links with the Netherlands, and there might have been people uh, mm -hmm. from Europe, in particular from the Netherlands, who have been working in this area and who have uh, recorded the language or, or have written about it. And is there anything known about that? And do you use mm -hmm. that material? Okay. Um, I think the documentation is. The recording, especially, is I don't know where this is. Uh, it's because on the, the researcher, uh, every activity in preserving language is different. And for example, for uh, language mapping, uh, I don't don't have the recording, but I have the word list of Tobati language as a uh, material before I uh, go to Tobati before and then uh, for the another activity is uh, did it with the another researcher too so I maybe I if you interest with the documentation maybe you can email me and then I can uh, search it and uh, and ask to my senior in the office so I can get this and can send you if you need it. Okay, I'll send you my email address and then we can contact each other. Thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Great. Um, and then Jeanette's question then. Um, mm -hmm. 
she her mic isn't working well but she asked if the um was the program funded by the Baden Bahasa or a split of 50 50 by the Yaipur city and Baden mm -hmm. Bahasa um mm -hmm. okay yeah. uh the question is was the program funded by Baden Bahasa or split 50 50 by Jaipur city or Baden Bahasa nah uh for the textbook yeah uh language apa tobati language textbook it's uh, fully funded by the Pura city government so we badan uh, we as badan bahasa or jaya or language representative office in papua province only facilitated uh, their project okay so the funding from the city but we did uh, we uh, create it okay just simple as that okay. how about after program will badan bahasa continue monitor the property language facilitation success yes uh, of course uh, that's why we create uh, we sign mou with uh, the Apple city government so the mou can be uh, tools to me to asking back to government uh, especially the Apple city government uh, what the action plan that they have promised before so we just uh, coordinating with the Apple city government uh, in the future, uh, so badan bahasa not uh, not work again uh, or doing something again in Jayapura City because uh, the responsibility of researching language in Indonesia law is in Jayapura City government. I think you can understand what I mean. <laughs> yes. Mm. And then, any, anyone else? I'm just making sure I didn't miss any questions. Did I? I, I sometimes get confused with the chat. Mm. Okay. Yeah. If anyone feels like their question has been um, left out, if you just want to ping a question in there, um, I'll get to you. So different from the old days of raising hands. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I think that's it. Um, but thank you so much, Satwika. That was a great paper and great questions, great discussions. Thank you to everyone. So we're going to move on. So give a virtual clap there. You're welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we're going to move on to our next presenter. So our next presenter is Ranak. Um, um, Cassie, more? I'll have to interrupt you. Oh, we sorry. haven't located Raunak uh, oh, okay. uh, just yet. So um, if Raunak's here, please make yourself known. He hasn't been seen in the break room, so we've been trying to get in touch with, with them. Um, so I would give it maybe five more minutes and then we might have some bonus content for you again to, to, to use the time efficiently, but let's wait for, for a few minutes and, and we might hear back from Arona Croy. Just to... This is starting to become something of a, a new uh, tradition here. Um, in the breaks, we'll have uh, sort of bonus materials with uh, um, speakers uh, and or chairs and or organizers. But what I, I do know that Raunak had uh, during the registration process some connectivity issues. So this, this might be the reason why. So we'll give it a few minutes and then I think um, Lily will take over after that.
if you have time to answer the question in group chat to see yeah i think that's fine we've got a few minutes okay thank you lily um i read first yeah uh from janet the paper sound very interesting indeed would you be willing to answer some more of my question if i have any special related to language representation of indigenous language of indonesia i wrote at university in malaysia and would love to hear um, hear about Mobile Bahasa and its good work in revitalization of Baden Bahasa Daerah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, what the answer is? What was that? I, I think Baden Bahasa uh, not only uh, revitalized language in Papua province, but uh, we did it in all of Indonesia. Uh, as as I know, Indonesia uh, have a uh, seven hundred eighteen language for twenty nineteen. So the lot of language we must to preserve. Uh, start from language mapping. Uh, language mapping is we did it with a dialectological approach with dialectometry and uh, the maps, and then language fidelity research is uh, adopted by UNESCO language fidelity, but we uh, modify modify. Uh, some of point that relate in Indonesian situation and then conservation. Conservation uh, is the one of program or activity that linguistic system development in phonology, morphology, syntax, and the writing system. So uh, the structure of the language must be written and documented in in the book or journal or what anything that can be safe in the documentation and then revitalization uh, revitalization uh, in Baden Bahasa we just uh, advocacy on the focus of the revitalization advocacy to local government so uh, local government must uh, must make a action plan in the future and the last is registration registration is uh, we uh, input what language uh, we are we done with language mapping are we done that language literature research so you can see in the one website and then the link of the website i can drop it in group chat maybe it can be answer your question thanks satwiko i think um that's great and i'm glad we had a little bit of extra time for it um I'm just looking in the chat. Is is Ronak here now? Hmm? No, the next speaker. No, we've emailed uh, them and nothing. So please do the okay, bonus so content. So the actual program will resume at nine nine o'clock, and um, we'll get some extra extra stuff your way now. So Lily. Okay. Oh, so sorry. I was we arrived. I misunderstood your message. So. Yes, um, we're going to have a little bit of bonus content, um, which I think is, as Rita said in the chat, it's kind of inevitable that although we um, were happy to have been able to avoid visa problems and flight cancellations and for the most part last minute illness, um, some cancellations are inevitable due to mostly internet connectivity. Um, so 
Um, we're just going to um, have a chat with our chair, um, Cassie Smith Christmas, who's been working on a really interesting project that's just wrapped up um, on language revitalization in a Gueltacht area, an Irish speaking area in Ireland with an emphasis on children. So it's extremely appropriate for this session. So um, Cassie, could you tell us a little bit about the project? Yeah, thanks so much, Lily. Um, it's great to just sort of wing in here and love <laughs> <laughs> it. Um, so this project is, um, should I, I, I actually have slides, should I? Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, even better if you have slides. Uh, yeah. so I'll do, um, I'll, um, let's see. But can I share my screen? Yes, I think I can. Um, wait. Sorry, I should have maybe just talked for this. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you can just start talking and then if you... Yeah. So it's a, it's a project that's um, funded, that was funded by the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, DC. And um, the name of the project was the SMILE project and um, sustaining minoritized languages in Europe. So there were six, uh, there were five other teams with this project and we each had a sort of different emphasis. And I worked with a group um, that I first contacted in May of 2018 and they're called TUSMA. And TUSMA means a good start in Irish. And um, the group, so in Ireland, so Ireland's quite, quite different from other language revitalization um, contexts because it's an endangered and autochthonous minority language, but it's also the national language. Mm. And at the national level, there's quite a lot of support for it. Um, one of the two key things um, being that it is a compulsory subject. So Satwika was talking about integrating uh, the language into the school. So in Ireland, anyone who goes to school within the Republic of Ireland um, will have access to the language through compulsory schooling. The other main thing is the Gwaeltacht area. So that's um, areas which traditionally have had a high density of speakers. And within Gwaeltacht areas, all immersion schools are in Irish. And so I was working with this in this lovely Grail Talked area um, called Corcohuina. For those of you who, who haven't had the pleasure yet, it's the place um, in the new Star Wars where uh, they show up at Luke Skywalker's Island. That's in Corcohuina. So, so cool. <laughs> so just some contextual reference there. But what happened is that even though it's a Gwaeltacht area, and even though there's a lot of support, they noticed that children were showing up to school, Irish immersion schools, without having previous experience of the language. And um, so what they did is they set up the program Too Small. And it really centers on the main different areas of, of language of the idea that in order to speak an endangered language to children, first you have to make the decision to speak them. So um, the director of the program told me, well, you know, whereas 20 years ago, there wasn't really a decision making process because, you know, Irish was the community language, it's the language you spoke to the neighbors, it was the language. So you didn't really think about it. But now, 20 years later, People have to sit down and think, right, what language am I going to speak to, to my children in? And so they made a lot of different supports to help the parents make this decision or whatever caregivers are in the house and then to sustain this. And I think one of the reasons why, um, and I argue in the report and then the other pieces that are, are still in press um, that I'm writing about, but I think that a lot of this a lot of the reason for the success of this particular program is that they've taken a very child-centered approach to it. So that um, it's not seeing the child as this sort of proverbial vessel to pour the language into, but seeing the child as playing an active role in creating and sustaining their own revitalization contexts. Um, and 
And I think another strength of the program is that at the same time, it valorizes the local, the, the local dialect um, and, and the local area um, is that it, it has a very inclusive approach so that um, one, of, one of the ideas is that in this inclusivity, so the, the local dialect is valorized, but they still um, are very aware that there are other dialects of Irish that children might have exposure to. And there are also other, um, there is also the standard, the language that would be um, spoken, uh, the language that is generally used in the school context. So that's the, that's the sort of precis of that. <laughs> Um, I don't know. Do you, do you want to ask more questions, or should I just keep yeah. rather calm? Or yeah, no, no, you can you can continue because this is uh, this is fascinating. But I was like curious, um, particularly about um, how, like, I guess, kind of how it works in um, in practice um, with um, that. You know, you like mentioned the children having agency, which I think is like a really really great um, approach. And so I was just wondering, like, if, yeah, if you can tell us kind of some more details about how that works in terms of the, you know, kind of the, um, the structure and the kind of how it works in practice. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I will attempt this um, screen share again, and then maybe it will work. Uh, yes. Okay. I just Excellent. have some. Yeah, that's working. Okay. okay. So can everyone see that then? Yeah. Yeah, okay, great. So these are sort of, this is how I sort of put it together, the, the sort of trajectory of their, um, of what they do. So the early years, so that's the brochure that's really designed to help the decision-making process. And then this is the play group. And these are the various materials that they have produced um, and then, this is a picture of me, yours truly, um, making <laughs> Christmas bags <laughs> for Santa visiting them. Um, this was the only um, Irish-speaking Santa in, in the Grail talk in this particular uh -oh. And then this is their, um, their drama group. And I think the agency really comes across in how the children play a role in reifying certain norms. Now, this goes back to earlier uh, work that I've, I've done on, on families, uh, well, what's called family language policy. And within family language policy, a lot of what you get is that the children resist the minority language. And you hear that a lot in revitalization context of, oh, the children just don't want to speak it. The children don't want to speak it. And I think that's true. And I think that that's why it's really important to understand, well, why don't the children want to speak it? How are they getting told by society in various ways that their language is not valuable? And I think that one of the interesting things about one of the reasons that Iraq Korkugrina is successful is because it, it makes the children want to speak the language through this very play-based approach. And then that enables the children to enact their agency and to reproduce these norms. So for example, with the Christmas thing, um, that lovely day, we were, um, there was Santa Claus and then there's a whole area where, um, where we had Christmas treats and Christmas crafts. And the children were all speaking to each other. Well, maybe not all, but from, I was actually playing the fiddle. So I will admit that I wasn't listening in all the time, but they were speaking to each other in Irish. They also came up to me and when they wanted to, um, to request their favorite Christmas carol, they would do so in Irish using the Irish name. And I think that that was very powerful because by, um, by speaking Irish to each other, they're building a peer norm of minority language use. 
and you don't always see that and you don't always see it in in an Irish context um, such as um, Tina Hickey's work has shown that as well so I think it's it's very um, it's a very important thing to think of how um, by providing them the ability to use the language and to build their skills that programs are um, developing their agency so then they can play a role in um, building certain norms, certain pro-revitalization norms with each other. And do you want to hear a kid who's in one of the kids in the study? Oh yes, definitely. Yeah. Okay. I love um, I love playing sound clips. <laughs> so I think that this is sometimes I sort of approach approach looking at things. I I like to look at the micro. Uh, because sometimes I feel like it's a bit like a poem, you know, that there can be so much in just a few little lines that really says a lot. So in this um, particular um, piece, um, the, the little girl, so what's interesting about what I found interesting about this was that myself and another researcher were going over and um, we're interviewing the parent about the different supports available to use Irish. And um, the little girl, first of all, she came in, uh, we came in, and she's very much playing the role of, she's only three, of woman of the house. And that she's offering things to us, you know, would you like a biscuit? All this in Irish. And then she shows us her teddy bear who um, is an Irish speaking teddy bear. So I'll just play the clip and then I'll talk a bit about it. And then, yeah. Okay, so I just wanted to play that clip. I think it's so cute. Thanks, that was great. <laughs> her and her teddy bear. So I think that besides just being cute, her and her teddy bear, I was thinking about this clip a lot. And not only is she playing a part in the adult conversation, but her language skills that she has gotten through the, the reflexive relationship of this particular program, Too Small, and then the home context, enables her to take part in the adult conversation in this very agentive way. And, um, but I think that what's also really important is that her little sister is present too. And her little sister is about one at the time of the recording. And thinking about it and thinking about my, my past work, um, which um, was dealing with um, a Scottish context, um, a, a particular family in Scotland where um, what happened is that the, the older siblings, and this is, is common in other contexts as well, that a lot of times the older siblings will model language shift to the younger siblings. So they'll model, okay, we don't, we don't speak uh, the minority language to each other. We don't address adult, adults in the minority language, or if the adults address us in the minority language, we speak in the majority language. But here you see that she has visitors in her home and she's, um, and she's addressing them in Irish. And so um, her little sister is being socialized really into language revitalization as opposed to language shift, as often happens. And another reason why I like this quote, uh, this particular piece, is that it goes with um, a model that I developed um, through working on this project. 
Now, a lot of times we talk about intergenerational transmission, um, especially in the field um, of family language policy, but I don't, I feel like sometimes we don't really clarify, well, what do we mean? And what are the goals of intergenerational transmission? So through working with Too Small, um, I arrived at this, this model that I think sort of encapsulates their three main goals when they talk about what they want the children to have, how they envision successful intergenerational language transmission. So I think the first is that the children's language use aligns with age appropriate speech norms um, from a linguistic sense so syntax morphology. Um, and then I think also that um, that the children's language use aligns with no local speech norms. So that the children in this case, that the children are using the Corfuglina Gueltacht. And then the last bit is embodied, which is really where I think that my, my main focus is becoming in terms of, well, how, how do we enable children to be agents of language revitalization? So the last bit is the idea that children want to speak the minority language and that they can experience the entirety of their social and emotional worlds through the minority language. And I think that you see that in this particular clip as well. So um, I won't go into the entire linguistics of um, the, the Corcogrino Goyaltacht or the salient features, but um, there are some features here. She speaks the very local form of so Anachuch Goyalan Inish. So Goyalan is, is the local for what they call the language locally and that um, particular um, apenthesis and uh, lenition for anyone who's who, who wants to know more about that in Anakut Squalen is very Korkaguina. Um, but mainly, um, and it's very much her, her speech aligns with your, um, with conceptions of what would be um, morphologically, syntactically, phonologically correct. And then key is that she wants to speak the language and that she's using this teddy bear to show, okay, I can experience many things in my world through the minority language. However, what's interesting as well is that at one point then later in the interview, um, I'm asking about sort of films and other supports for, for the language. And she comes in and she says, movies, Virla. So movies are in English. So, and then her mom clarifies that what she means is that Disney movies are in English. So already she has this, this beginning of this understanding of um, what's in Irish and what's in English, what parts of her world can be experienced in Irish and what can't. So that's just sort of a, a little snapshot of, um, of that project. That's fantastic, Cassie. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, um, with that, with kind of totally spontaneously as well, that was... A that was great. Um, thank you for rising, rising to the. Oh, no worries. There. Um, so we've got a couple of questions in the chat, um, which I'll just read out um, to save time. And you've touched on these, but just in case you kind of have any more comments to add. So um, Sarah asks, when you say that the study was based more around the success and motivation of the individual, how did specific methodology achieve that? I think you like you've you've shown that quite a bit, but I just wanted to mention it in case there was anything else that you wanted to. Yeah, it was, it was very, very ethnographic. So it was basically, I teamed up, my co-PI was Orla Rochelle, who runs Too Small. And so that, um, you know, it was participant observation and then interviews with caregivers, but it was also in conjunction with an earlier project that I'd done with the um, Irish Research Council that looked at, it took a very ethnographic case study family approach to three different families. And so I continued working with those families throughout the project and also got to know more families and just, just basically hung around with people all the time. It was, it was great. It was, it was a dream project, really. <laughs> it sounds fantastic. And then um, from Natalia, um, she was asking, 
what is the ideology that the children in the Irish medium schools hold for Irish? Is it mainly their language of communication or of their identities? That's a, an interesting. Yeah, that's a, that's a really order. different. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, so the in in Grail Talk areas now, I can't answer for all Irish medium schools, um, and it wasn't a, a study specifically on Irish uh, medium schools. Um, there is some other work on that. So if you want to, if you're interested, um, Noel Merhu has done a lot of work on that. Um, but in Corcoguina, the really the goal was that, well, basically caregivers and practitioners approached it as they, they are worried that children will have more of a, um, that the Irish has the danger of being relegated to the school. So mm -hmm. all of their efforts were about counteracting that. How do you make it part of their identity? Um, and this idea of, of being, being from Corcoguina and being embedded in a community and in a place. And that aligns with the wider ethos of Corcoguina as well, the idea of place but not making place an exclusive entity, which, um, which is one of the reasons why I think it's successful. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, so I think we can now move quite seamlessly on to our next talk. Um, and our speaker is here. Cassie, would you like to introduce them? Yes. Sorry uh, about that. You're going, <laughs> going from your own uh, yeah, that's great. into the next one but that was brilliant that was that was a really really great bonus uh uh bonus talk <laughs> thanks so much um so our next speaker is sujoy sakar from the central institute of indian language and the title of sujoy's talk is language and education and language imposition a case study from west bengal Sujoy, are you there? Yeah, he's definitely here. So we'll just wait for the audio okay. to work. Sujoy, we can't hear you. Um, do you need to check the settings in your in your computer or raise the mic microphone volume? And to avoid this in the future, we have the test room. So it's good to go there before your talk is manned all day. There's someone there to help with, with audio issues. So um, you could also try muting and then, then switching it back on again, Sujoy. That sometimes helps. So Sujo is taking a moment. I'm here, tech support. I did hear back from Raunak, um, and they they did have, like I said, in connection with the registration, they did have connectivity issues, and so he managed to they managed to email me, but uh, there was no file attachment, and they said we'll join you shortly. But I think it it is a bit tricky, so he just can't can't connect. And it's true, Julia's idea is good to to send in slides in advance. Um, the, the main problem with that is managing these these files, but uh, uh, definitely we can encourage people in the future that if you know the internet is not good, then ideally you will you will send us a, a slide so we could look at look at the slides. But usually they can't connect at all. This seems to be the case, um, unfortunately. So Sujoy, you may want to log out and log back in and also check the settings on your on your computer or or share the share the slides. Julia, how's the I'm just looking at the chat here. So Julia, how's the internet connection in Fiji? I could talk, I guess. When um it's okay in the university, but my friend will be speaking in the middle of the night, therefore from her. Oh 
Um, and normally the video isn't great from there. Um, so I have a copy of it just in case. Yeah, that's a good solution. Co-host co is also, co-presenter co is a good solution. Or like, yeah, switching video off, that's often quite good. And we're trying yeah. to avoid all the technical glitches by having the break room where you can test your yeah, settings. We will, we will practice in the break room beforehand, but that means she has to stay up all night. Oh, for all. That's tough. No. So the time time issues are tricky. Yeah. If we thought about it, we could have negotiated a time when which was more suitable for her. No. Yeah. Yeah. We did take requests, but I'm, I'm sorry, Julia. Um, Sue Joy, let's try again. Yeah. Can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Success. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Great. I'll, I'll mute my mic. Is it visible from your side? Yes, Hello? looks great. It's all good. Okay. So shall I start? Yes, Hello? please. Sure. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So the topic I'm going to speak uh, is language in education and language imposition, a case study from West Bengal. So the previous uh, two scholar mentioned about the positive side about language revitalization, but this topic is not that positive side of language in education in West Bengal. Language is a medium of instruction. At the same time, it is a symbol of culture, identity, and knowledge system. At the same time, language can be used as a tool of oppression and discrimination. Now, let us see the example from West Bengal. Before I go into the main topic, let me, I mean, briefly mention about the language and tribals of West Bengal and India. Um, according to 2011 census, there are 22 scheduled languages. The, these 22 scheduled languages um, uh, are privileged to uh, enjoy certain facility in government, uh, sec government fields, uh, as well as in education. Apart from that, there are 99 non scheduled languages. Now, 96.71% population speak 22 scheduled languages. Rest of the people, rest of the people, uh, that is 3.29% population speak rest of the languages. Uh, 2011, 2011 census identified 270 mother tongues, uh, which returned with more than 10,000 speaker or 10,000 speaker. So census doesn't mention about the languages which has less than 10,000 speaker. On the other hand, People Linguistic Survey of India, which is another reference for languages in India, mentioned 720 languages and 28 languages in West Bengal. Among these 28, 10 languages in Bengal, specifically in Northern side, either extinct or on the verge of extinction. Now, the tribes. Uh, in India, there is no as such uh, definition for tribes. But whenever we talk about tribes or tribals, we refer to Article, uh, article of Constitution of India, Article 342. In Article 342, uh, some communities are mentioned as scheduled tribes. And we also, I mean, in, on paper, uh, Rain research mentioned those community as scheduled tribe. Um, there are 705 uh, communities mentioned as scheduled tribes. In Bengal, 40 communities are scheduled tribe. Total population uh, in India, uh, total tribal population in India is uh, 10 crore 42 lakhs, uh, 81,034. 8.6 total, 8.6 percent of the total population is tribals. In West Bengal, 5.8 percent of the total population is tribals. And this uh, West Bengal tribal population constitute 5, 5.08 of India's total ST population. One more interesting information is that 564 sub district, that is blocks, taluks, tehsil, these are administrative units. Uh, of areas have more than 50% ST population or at least 20,000 tribal population. Now, let me introduce the 
area i am going to mention or the community i am going to mention here the present community i am going to mention is rava community rava is one of the 40 scheduled tribes of west bengal they can be mainly found in uh, kuch bihar alipurdwar jalpaiguri uttar dinajpur dakshin dinajpur and malda district i personally belong to jalpaiguri district and i had my education graduation from kuch bihar district so i am familiar with this area apart from bengal Uh, rafa community can be found in a neighboring uh, neighboring state assam meghalaya the present area uh, mentioned in the map is foskadanga poro eco park area it, this area is nearby reserve forest and the area or the village i stayed it's a eco park run by the community people mother tongue is rafa which is tibeto bormon language the total population in west bengal is 27800 20 in jalpaiguri district the total population is 14487 the rafa community mainly surrounded by the rajbongshi and bengali speaker speaker in the following slide we are going to see in which surroundings they stay and what is the different uh, of the area from the mainstream areas slide one so it's visible the area is near by the forest uh, the activity that day uh, seasonal activities that is agriculture or cultivation and they are also dependent on uh, nature fishing and others so uh, so it is clear from the previous three slide from the picture that they totally uh, they live in a totally different situation if we consider nearby district or town if we consider the uh, surroundings the environment everything is different so the way of life is also different now let let us see the government data what does the government data say so the government that, that this is census 2011 data this also support you can see the main work is cultivator agricultural labor which support the previous uh, 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 photographs and in this village most of the population uh, is uh, belong to schedule tribe community that is 1991 so from so far we have a clear uh, we have a idea about the community and in which environment they stay now let us see what is the situation of language in education in west bengal there is no as such language policy in education in west bengal what i try to find or what i got let me i mean uh, mention here the west bengal primary education act 1973 west bengal school service commission act 1970 and 1997 west bengal school uh, schools control of expenditure act 2005 all these acts are about administration how to run school what should be the procedure but they have not mentioned about the teaching or the textbook or the or the teachers the teachers from who should be from which community all these are not mentioned so these are administrative document uh, purely administrative document however in bengal bengali is the main medium of instruction apart from that hindi urdu nepali santali Uh, is also used as a medium of instruction in in the positive side uh, in 2018 government of west bengal included three languages kamtapuri rajbongshi kurmali as official languages along with bengali nepali urdu hindi santali odia punjabi but uh, at the same time government did not mention anything what is going to be the stand of this languages in education they are going to be used as medium of instruction or they are going to be introduced as a subject this picture is not clear now let us see the scenario language in education policy scenario in indian uh, in pan india situation so the very uh, not very latest one of the major document that is right to education act uh, which is Uh, supported by the constitution of uh, india 
Article 21A, the state shall provide free and compulsory education to all children uh, of the age six uh, to 14. Uh, in such manner, the state may by law determine. Article uh, uh, 29.2.E of RTE mentioned active learning in a child friendly and child center manner. Article 29.2.F, medium of instruction shall as far as practicable in child's mother tongue. Article 29.2.G, making the child free of fear, trauma, and anxiety, and helping the child to express uh, view freely. Article 29.F, the child, the children are given opportunity and facility to develop healthy manner in a condition of freedom and dignity that childhood youth are protected against exploitation and against moral and material abandonment. National policy on education 68, 1968 and 1986 did not clearly mention about mother tongue, but it supported the regional languages and some of uh, supported the uh, material should be, I mean, local uh, contextualized. National Curriculum Framework is another wonderful document which clearly mentioned primary school education must be covered through the home language. At the same way, National Knowledge Commission also mentioned language issue must be explicitly taken on the board in designing school curriculum. So from all this document, it is very much clear that the importance of mother tongues, child-centered, child-friendly education was always focus of this document. Now let us see the reality. So uh, for my study, I have visited uh, two school. One is Poro Forest Village Primary School, another is Poro Forest Village Junior High School. Now let's see what is the reality in those schools. These, these are two schools. Ah, um, local majority language is Rava because uh, most of the population in the village belongs to Rava community. But the medium of instruction used in those school is Bengali. Local teachers nil. Most of the teachers, more, not most of, uh, apart from one teacher, uh, rest of the teacher belongs to Bengali community and hardly they have any knowledge about Rava language. Textbook, the textbook across Bengal is mainly in Bengali. It is uh, aimed to Bengali learners at the same time based on the urban culture mostly. Language used in the home and playground is Rava. So it is very much contradictory when the Rava is dominant in the daily life, in the community, but in the school setup, the Bengali is occupying the space, which is very depressing for the um, children. Now, let's see the medium of instruction issues. Eight All uh, India School Education Survey, a consensus report 2016, 86.62 schools at the primary stage teaches from mother tongue in comparison to 92.07, which was in seventh survey. Only 40 language, languages are used as medium of instruction at the elementary level. Only 23 tribal languages as medium of instruction. When hundreds of tribal languages in India, is the, India are there, only 23 tribal languages are used as medium of instruction. Now see the dropout rate. The dropout rate, the year-wise dropout rate, uh, let's take the 2011-12 data. In class um, 1 to 5, 30.3%. Uh, when it comes to class 1 to, I mean, the next step, the dropout rate increase, 57.2. Uh, it increase in the higher stage. So it's clear that there is there is some gap or there may, may be some problem for which the dropout rate is increasing. Now let's see the Rava. This information, uh, this table is about Rava literacy. So you see uh, the age group, literate, illiterate, and total. The total population is uh, 27,820, illiterate is 12,884, uh, and literate is 
14,936. So uh, it is clear that illiteracy is very much uh, prominent in the Rava community. Uh, what can be the reason of this? I mean, though I am, I have not, uh, I mean, explored uh, what can be the reason. But let's see the other study. What the other study says. The survey for assessment of dropout rate in 21 states. West Bengal is one state. So uh, this survey taken 21 states. This report is 2013 report. That 21.28 boys drop out only because of lack of interest. And the girls is, the number is 19.82 uh, in case of girls. What they are doing, you can say, I mean, we can say, okay, maybe for the economic reason they're dropping out or they are not interested, they don't, they can't have, I mean, financial support from home. But let's see what they're doing. 23.12 boys and 17.83 girls after dropping out, sitting idly at home. What is the possible reason? This possible reason because they are not interested the material, the language used in school, it doesn't attract the early, um, early, uh, I mean, children. Uh, uh, let's see the Mohun, uh, another study, education failure of linguistic minority all over the world is primarily related to the mismatch between the home language and the language of formal instruction. Same is Sujata 1994, found that one major cause behind the high push out rate of tribal students was their inability to establish and communication communication link with the teacher. So it is clear, I mean, uh, this mismatch is a huge obstruction for the students to, I mean, continue their education. Now let us go back to the constitutional safeguard. If we see the constitution of India, article 39, article 46, which clearly says uh, the, the children, basically the children from scheduled caste and scheduled shall, shall protect them, the state shall protect them from social injustice and all form of exploitation. Um, one of the major, one of the important article of constitution in India regarding language or mother tongue is C50A, the state, uh, which state, uh, the state to provide adequate facility for, uh, 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 primary uh, instruction facilities for instruction in the mother tongue at the primary stage of education to children belonging belonging to linguistic minority group. Uh, so uh, see, you, in one side, constitution is saying, okay, we need this, and the other end, in reality, school it is not happening. The picture is totally different. Now, this is kind of depressing situation. Now, let's see, is there any hope? The very recent document which came out last, last month, National Education Policy 2020, it clearly mentioned about home language and mother tongue it should be in textbook material. Uh, at the same time, uh, the language of transaction between teachers and students will still remain the home language and mother tongue wherever possible. Now the twist is wherever possible. Who is going to interpret wherever possible? The education uh, comes under concurrent list of Indian constitution to so center and state both are responsible for it. Now the state may choose the tribal languages as home language or mother tongue, which, uh, I mean, which need to be introduced in school or they may interpret in different way. Only uh, we need to wait for time to see this national education policy is going to be a hope for us or it's going to be another disappointing um, factor which is going to fail only because of implementation. Uh, so, uh, uh, see, I mean, uh, this over, this is, a simple, this is a small example in, in this situation. I'm sure you, these examples are available, available in every state in, in India. Uh, 
so the major language speaker they are not interested about the minority language speaker uh, here the tribal language or or more specifically the rava community so they don't want to give the space this harmonious space to this my people of the periphery okay they they also deserve, they also have the right to uh, enjoy their language in education from the beginning hope in future this situation is going to be changed uh, with this i am um, finishing my talk uh, thank you i mean uh, i should thank uh, the host who uh, gave me place to stay in the village in two season i was uh, lucky enough to be there in two season one is cultivation time another is flowering time thank you thank you so much Thank you so much, Sujoy, and great keeping on time. Um, so yeah, questions in the chat, and we'll go through the questions. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions after this interesting talk. Thanks again, Sujoy. Yeah, please, madam. SMS. SMS. So questions, you, you can type them if, if you're having trouble um, with your, your camera, I can just read them out. Um, yeah, just one minute, let me yeah. see the chat box. Yeah, yeah, I got it, I got it, I got it. Yes. I got it, okay. Yeah. Uh, hello, she's a good person. By the link, okay. From what I gather, since Rava is not taught in medium of instruction, even in their homeland, instead it seems Rava are taught in Bengali. Yeah. What are the reasons? Is it lack of consciousness or on the part of the speaker or the policy? Okay. Uh, I don't know who is there, Madam or Sir. The name say Linovo. Okay. So your question is Rava is taught in Bengali. Actually, Rava is not taught in, even in Bengali. Its Bengali language is imposed upon to the Rava speaker. So they don't even get uh, the facility uh, 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 in school. Rava as a medium of instruction, at the same time, Rava uh, um, or Rava as a subject. OK, and now you ask about the reason. The reason is very deep rooted, I think. Uh, the, uh, who are the policy maker in state level? I mentioned the education come, uh, comes under concurrent reach. So center as well as the state responsible for this. So when it comes to implementation, the state is responsible for it. Okay. Now, the, who below, who are these administrators? These administrators mostly belong to the majority language speaker. In case of Bengal, it's the Bengali Vadralok or the uh, Bengalis who are uh, highly educated, uh, who doesn't have, I mean, uh, sorry for this comment, uh, most of uh, whom doesn't have this awareness, okay, language is very much important. When it comes to their language, your language is important, but uh, when it comes to education and others, my language is not important because my language is a small language, or probably my language is a tribal language. So this is the situation. Uh, and policy level, there is no at such clear cut policy for the tribal language education in Bengal or India. Thank you. The second question Do the teachers actually command the tribal languages? Nicholas Osler? Mm, not really, actually. Uh, hardly. I mean, I met only one teacher. Uh, uh, the teachers are wonderful. I mean, but the only problem is that the language. They can't speak their language at the same time, uh, these children, they can't speak, uh, speak Bengali. Only one um, uh, teacher who tried to learn Rava uh, and uh, introduce some words in his classroom so the Rava children can understand what the teacher is saying. Okay, uh, third question, do you think the NEP 2020 is uh, 2020 will help definitely NEP 2020 is um, a hope for uh, 
for the um, um, minority speakers in india see any policy it comes with uh, positive as well as some drawbacks but we should uh, the one policy can be uh, uh, one policy can be a plus point if it is properly implemented so the success of nep as a document is wonderful but the success of nep is going to depend on us us i mean the people who are directly or indirectly associated associated with uh, policy making or implement uh, sorry not policy making in implementation be it in west bengal or be it in other state thank you uh, any more question uh, this was the last question for me any other question please Well, thank you so much, so much, Sujo. I will give a, a virtual clap um, for that wonderful presentation. And so then moving right along, um, I think we still have a minute, but um, the next presenters are Kat, Kate, and at, yes, at Top End Language Lab, Dar Charles Darwin University, um, Richard Green, who is a Darug speaker, and Deborah Shapira, Jamie Garcia, and William Raff, all of the University of Technology in Sydney. Um, and the title of their talk is Teaching from the Dead. And, yes, and I'm guessing that some of you are in Australia, so I think it's very... It's it's six, 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 6 p.m., yeah. Okay. And some okay, of my colleagues. Not so bad. Yeah. <laughs> not, not so bad not at all, bad. no. Um, <laughs> look, I hope you're keeping well in the present pandemic yes and do look after yourselves and i'm glad that we can uh visit safely <laughs> online and it's just me be me, me presenting the others are not coming but um i will i'll share the slides and um i did a test so hopefully the audio will work so yes um Hopefully this is, oh yes, I've got to expand. So thank you for allowing us to present our work, what we're doing with the Darug language. And in a way I'm glad and worried that Jackie Troy will be here, is present too. And um, I hope she'll comment too and correct where things are wrong. Um, I'd like to acknowledge where I'm speaking from. I'm, I'm up in um, Darwin in Larrakia country and I'm working with the Top End Language Lab, where we're working with computational linguistics, looking at reclaiming languages through oral resources to avoid the transcription roadblock. And this is a project that I did when I was back in Sydney. So I'd like to also acknowledge the Darug people and the elders past and present of the Darug nation. And say, Ninga nyana banga mari dalang wingaru dane, nina diama mari dalangwa dalang this is that what we're sharing in our language we hope can be done in all languages around Australia. Um, the Darug language was the first language to, um, to uh, experience invasion. And it was, of course, the first language when Philip arrived the convicts. The next year, smallpox was introduced to the community, which was the first uh, pandemic in Australia. And this wiped out about 80, 90% of the East Coast people. And um, it was called Gullah Gullah. So Gullah Gullah uh, by the local people. And this was um, very devastating because people had no resistance to smallpox, unlike you know Europe at the time. It was, um, I tried to draw a tight timeline, it's a bit out of scale. But after this, it was in the 1960s that Richard Green was listening to his elders speaking. He was then actually moved, I think, where he grew up in New Zealand. But in 1994, Jacqueline Troy's research brought out the Sydney Language Dictionary. And Richard used this, uh, uh, teaching himself words every day, repeating them. And in about 2005, he started teaching in schools around Sydney. That program has finished, but in a sense, it was one of those programs focused at schools initially. Then um, the William Dawes notebooks were published online with 
uh, recordings by Richard Green. And we now have public lessons during this January Sydney Festival run by one of, uh, um, <laughs> just into, I know no, I'm going to say the wrong name again. I've heard her name, but she, she was, she studied with, um, with Richard and now teaches herself. So we have very few speakers. So as you can see from the time scale, it basically was a language that was considered dead. But, and given the time that um, it's, it started, there was no audio recordings at the time. That at, at no audio recordings done at the time that the, the direct were dying, dying out and the language was being lost. So the other problem too we have is the language did not develop over time. Um, as well as being, it's, it's been really good listening to the previous speakers over the last day or so, that so many people talk about the importance of language for identity. To speak your language is so important as an uh, affirmation of identity, but also it's uh, about a knowledge system. So that we did not have Dureg to discuss the knowledge that the Dureg talks about, so that that knowledge system was being lost. Um, and also we had lack of contact with other living languages that were that affected the pronunciation. So. Um, Richard and my pronunciation is not great. It's not particularly correct in terms of the spelling that was um, used to convey to the present generation of how this was supposed to be pronounced. It's all through the, the written form. And, but if we work with other languages nearby, we could probably improve the pronunciation of those words. Um, the knowledge content of the language has not been used, I said, so that hasn't developed. It's the whole around Australia, there is this problem because languages were prohibited in speech that we couldn't talk about um, the, the new words that come in, were, didn't come into the language. So there's, there's become a Creole when you want to try and talk about the Western technology and Western influences. Um, there's ongoing lack of community of speakers to actively reclaim the language. So we haven't got a large body to create this environment that we talk. And we're trying to redevelop an understanding from the perspective of these speakers. So we, if to reclaim that knowledge, we need to understand well, what did the speakers talk about? What would they value? What was happening on the country that they were talking about? So as I said, linguistic work, we had no audio recordings and I can't spell in English even. So we had um, governors Philip and King uh, recorded some words, officers of the Marines, Matthews, Dawes, Collins and Hunter all recorded words and Jacqueline Troy's works based on that. And also Richard Green went back to the sources and um, developed language from the written words. I started working with Richard on web, the web area. So we were, we got up, we got Jacqueline Troy's dictionary up as an interactive text dictionary. Um, started recording words to link into that so you could hear the words spoken as Richard spoke them. Um, and then we started developing these worksheets. So we got uh, worksheets around greetings, um, uh, local country, sort of various topics that I'll go into more with the next stage of the work. And um, when you uh, hover over these highlighted words, you actually can hear the sound of them spoken. But also it tries to tell, give you a bit of context of the language, like why these things are said this way and it's not direct translation, what are the colloquialisms, what's the meaning of the language. So from those worksheets, we wanted to make more immersive learning. In fact, what Richard said to me was, he wanted people around Sydney to start speaking the language, to have it spoken. Uh, wouldn't it be great? So we had minimum face-to-face -face classes. So we had the online lessons and we knew that the learning had to be on country. What would be spoken about in Darug is about the country and the, the activity on country. So we wanted representations of this country, which immerse the learners in the landscape or the human environment, the language where the language becomes relevant. And it can be shared without introduction of these new words in the Creole. Or, so we're also developing students experience because we had Aboriginal students engaged in doing the animations around the language speaking to represent the story through body language and expression. So they were doing their animation subjects and came along. We had gaming students, we had Richard the speaker, and we combined these all to make a, um, a game. One scene is two dimensional, one is 3D. So this is just the, an example of the, the second 2D scene and the animation of the kangaroo. In Gaia, Baragarang. 
So the students entirely developed these animations. The course was a low budget, we did it in 2D, much easier. And it made, um, we're the only ones who were animated at the time, we've got memory issues <laughs> over the game, but it's, it's a chance to use this kangaroo can speak in other languages in similar locations is the aim. So, so the topic areas that we covered in, in those lessons and then put into the game were welcome, country, weather, local environment, greetings and kinship. And I'll just quickly go through sort of why, why we chose each one. Like welcome to country, like the, um, so I forgot a name, the Maori woman uh, yesterday spoke about how in, we introduce ourselves into, in, in, in Aotearoa, it's with um, your mountain, your river, your, your people. And for Aboriginal people here, it's um, a welcome to country is based around, uh, um, the, uh, the sort of greeting is started around where, where's your country, where are you from? And so the, we start the country, the, the game with a welcome. And welcomes are generally highly personalised but have some standard components. Not, not as quite as ritualistic as the Māori one, but it's um, got a lot of sort of components like that. However, existing English versions that we use of welcome do not always translate well into language. It's the language expression of is much different. So we want an example of a, a sort of you know, a direct welcome. For future, we aim to introduce some words from the game in, in this narrative so that the idea of here you get a holistic view of the language and then you start le learning and emphasizing the details. So how do you, how do you teach in a game is, is the sort of things we're trying to tackle. And the language that is in the welcome is, this is often an instruction how to engage with the new country. And so we use this to open the game and credit the makers of the language resources and the animations. The second part is we talk on country. We come in on a magpie, we're flying around country. So, Again, it's important to provide the location environment of the language you're speaking. And we're using a 3D extraction from Google Maps and it's in Unity. This is the open level to start talking about country. And in future, we can use the same technique to extract from any country, any area. So we could fly in. The, there's often bird totems around different parts of the coast so that you could fly into any part of the coast and start talking in that language. So we're looking at how to, this, it was a sort of very cheap prototype, how we can expand that to other languages. And the language in this scene is um, language for naming country and simple verbs for movement. So this first level lesson covers pronouns and loc locatives. So we tried to structure it so that it had a limited vocabulary and a limited grammar for each level as we expect, so we could expand it. Um, so the next stage was weather, because while they're flying in, they can see the weather and comment on the weather. So it's a common topic of conversation that will be included in walking around Sydney. Hopefully we could talk about the weather. And it presents a short prototype on cloudy weather, which we all sort of rather love, or frequent droughts. Um, in future, we would like to extend to the night time. We can include a Stellarium, um, a, a plugin so that you can actually see material that's been done around Aboriginal naming of the stars and the star groups. And so that could be included and also the seasons. And for language, this section introduces some nouns, adjectives and continuous tense to discuss the weather. Um, then we took local environment, the bird then goes, flies into the 2D section and lands and the words are about the immediate world around us, which in this case is the world around UTS, because um, that's where the bird flies to on the map and then goes down. Uh, UTS was the university where I, was, I did this um, game. And part of UTS was originally a border ground for a place to educate young boys and the community about caring for country. So it's a significant area for the community. And in future, this can be extended with teaching lessons on country. So it, it's a teaching area. We could use that as an environment for more teaching. And language, this lesson is designed to focus on animals and plants both near and far to develop directions and imperatives. Finally, the last part of that 2D scene, there's greetings. Um, so when people arrive for a corroboree, they introduce themselves to each other as we would in the street. So we, we're getting into what would it be like using this language in the street. In future, this can be extended to explain different origins and identities, like how people describe where they're coming from and how they identify. 
you know, obviously it's not around their job. Um, oh, sorry, and the language is based around how to describe yourself and your identity. And finally, kinship, because kinship is important in Indigenous societies in terms of your identity and your relationship to other people comes as a first priority to understand. So why we want to introduce to any language or community, in an introduction to any language or community, we need to put the player in relationship to others in the game. And um, the prototype is, uh, is the sort of, it's a beginning prototype of an extended introduction to the full family group. So we just have an auntie and uncle in this one. And this introduces names of family relations and asking and answering questions, so response. Um, so the country, as I said, it's 3D map. This is actually a whale coming up. Um, it's sort of hard to see when it's not animated, but the whale comes up, breaches and drops. And it's in a very shallow area, but it's sort of so you can you will notice it as you're coming up. Nyai Wumarawa Garigal Nora. This is um, Wulamalu, the place of many whales, and it's um, just near UTS. So it's it was a few sites are named, and we can extend it. We want to extend it. You can actually fly down to each of those sites and learn more about those sites as they were described at the time in the language. Um, this is the 2D scene and it seems to have started halfway through, but this is uh, when the magpie leaves the 3D scene, it comes into the 2D scene. And you first see it without subtitles. In the second run through, you see it with the Durig site, site subtitles. And the third time through, you get the English subtitles. So. Biada, Wingro. Nora, Nona Angalang, Ingina, Gariberi. Gariberi is uh, um, the knowledge place, the Crobbery Ground. Um, oops, sorry, that's interesting. It's going to play itself. Yes. So, also for, I mean, so it was partly creating environment for learning, creating um, the context, the 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 dial, uh, the, the vocab for learning but also how on earth is it someone going to learn an environment? Because it's really quite full on, a whole lot of new language. Um, they're very, like, although the students tried to animate it, it's very hard to animate a lot of these aspects. So another thing we tried to do is to repeat words a lot so that in the weather section, you know, I'm seeing clouds, naya na ninbura, the clouds are black, ninbura wa nan, the clouds are full with rain, ninbura wa ga walin ma. And then I am seeing rain, Naya Nina Wallin. So repeating the words so that people start thinking, relating that to the weather. And when you first do it, you're doing it sort of more unconsciously, but slowly you see it more as what it actually is saying. Um, also, we're trying to relate it to local events in the sense that the local environment, the greetings and the kinship terms are all aimed to create a simulation of the experience of community events where language would be used. So recreate an authentic language speaking environment. We don't have that language speaking community to do it. Um, and then here the language will only exist as part of a community of speakers, which we don't have. So to recreate that. And we also know that community events are important to make the language learning more informal. And so um, have less focus on language learning and more focus on the activity so that people can do it more naturally, less forced just as you were talking in that um, the Irish language in learning, if it became more of a fun event, if the students were, oh, are we also, not so much in Dari, but there's been places at schools where the students, um, we had Radri in one school and the um, teacher was having problems getting the students to really engage with formal lessons. So then she just said, well, let's, let's go fishing up the local creek and we'll do it in Radri. So they, had to write their own stories, create their own scenarios, take a lot of the initiative themselves, and then they could really engage with the language and it became something of interest to them. And it was easy because the teachers didn't speak much language either. We've got this problem that we don't, our teachers won't be speaking the language themselves. So if the students can take the initiative, it makes it much easier for the teacher. So that's, um, oh, the other thing was when we're looking to try and um, uh, repeat to reuse the stuff. We looked at the animations and how we how we got 
from because the language yeah the language well, I forgot to say sorry was the language side has these language lessons on it and it can be downloaded as a vocabulary list which is part of the site um, the audio examples are all accessible from one so when you request the lesson you get the lesson download you get the audio examples the English and the translate the the direct and the translation in English and this then is um, used to generate the game. But of course, then we need the backgrounds and the, the context and the animations. So we're looking at how this can be reused. So if you get the dialogue, how can you syn synchronize? The lip syncs and gestures are great, but we can't keep regenerating them for different languages. But if they're going to be talking about the similar things, well, then maybe we can reuse them. So what we're looking at those sort of resources. And it's really quite hard to control, actually. And um, so yeah, I've, I've, I think so. Last thing was last slide is um, about linking to the curriculum. The my interest in this work is I sort of mentioned a bit is that the indigenous knowledge is held within the language and within the land. Um, we are wanting to put the indigenous knowledge into the curriculum in a way that's authentic. So in engineering, we talk about the engineering before colonisation, how Aboriginal engineers are working now with um, European technology, what's being done, so that we can understand the different approach, like more community approach to app, to the app mobile app development. And so to do that, language is very much a component of that process. And we want to incorporate language as a way of describing, um, it can just be a way of describing how different users use technology. So an Aboriginal person, we do project Aboriginal projects on country and we discuss how the community would respond to their project, to their um, ideas for solving problems that may not be appropriate for different communities in different um, contexts. Um, so if you're going to, um, but also for the people themselves that we're working with, the location and affiliation to land requires the language of that land. You can't really describe the land. You can't understand the land without the language that was developed to describe it and to explain it. And when we've got now all the wet weather and the climate changes, the, we can use the stories of the country to describe what's happened in the past. And because Aboriginal knowledge, Ar Aboriginal stories retain a lot of um, memory of events such as the early sea rises, um, uh, five to 15, uh, seven to 15,000 years ago with the end of the last ice age these stories of the sea level rises are included in the narratives of the community. So we have a lot of knowledge of what things were like, how people adapted to that. We have the knowledge of the fire burning is held in stories. And we now have a lot of problem with bushfires because we haven't followed that knowledge. And we need to reclaim that knowledge through language and through this work. But also we can use things like, um, as I was saying, that some of the knowledge from the past can be used for future technology like kinship as respect for others to promote more trust in public life. We have a very great dearth of trust and we need to promote that. How was the Aboriginal process of kinship of ensuring everyone was related to other, everyone else coming together regularly for corroborates to discuss ideas and share ideas and not compete was really important for creating this public trust. And also uh, people now with the pandemic, people are going off into Aboriginal people say, well, when the smallpox came, what did you do? How did you cope with the pandemic at that time? And there's stories around um, like the Cobragol, a people of Sydney who around George's River and the Cobra worm is was an antibiotic worm. So they ate a lot of Cobra worm, but it didn't work against smallpox. So there's you know, just, what, what can we get from the knowledge of the community? And like, thank you. And I forgot to put up my, <laughs> my game link it's actually online so i'll i'll put that into the chat channel thank you thank you so much kat and thanks um bang on time again all the presenters <laughs> are doing great with this um so i see thank you for a wonderful presentation and really look forward to seeing the link there and um, so i see that we already have some questions in um jacqueline has a question yeah. um if, if you want to turn on your camera or I can yeah, I've got that. Yeah. Hi, hi Cassie. Yeah. And um, I just want to say something before um, Kat answers any questions. I 
I don't know why you have any concern. The work that you are doing and have been doing for, I think it's more than 20 years now, um, to breathe, you know, energy into the use of um, Daruk with Richard and with other people, including myself, um, is just nothing short of a miracle. And I, I think back to the time when you came to me and said, I've got this idea of doing things online. I'm a, a you know, a computers person, a, um, an app, a coder, and I want to use my, my knowledge to do this. And, you know, I use your Daruk Dalong um, website that you worked up with Richard um, and, and everything that you've done since. So I think it's all a really important, um, it's a really, really important lesson in what can be done to get a language renewed. I'm, I'm using the word renewal now. Revival sounds like something's really died and it, this language didn't. Um, and it, it's not because yeah, it's that's right. really keeping it going. So thanks, Kat. Sorry, I shouldn't bang on so much, but I'm, I'm wildly... Didgerigura in the language of Sydney, the Indaruk. Didgerigura, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's... um and with your work because it was your research that gave Richard the language back and also it was um, that your naming at the Sydney language avoided a lot of the politics so which I'll explain to this question about Gamma Regal. Um, I will give you Richard's version and Jackie might want to say there's another version that uh, Darug is the root Darug I say again I sometimes put the European you oh, the English you rather than the European you so it's Darug is um, the root language of the area and Gamaregal, um, Darawal are dialects, you say. The, the Gal, the Wal is a, means a dialect of. So he would say that the, these were, the original basis was Darug and these languages have become dialects from it. And one of the um, Gadigal stories actually is that a um, long time ago, the uh, Gadigal people, who are who are the people around the UTS, the Gadigal people moved inland as the waters rose, and the Darug said, "You can have this basin area until you get your land back." Basically, the the Darug people were living on the continental shelf, which is now underwater, and the Darug were gave them the Sydney Basin, that eastern eastern area of the basin. So it's um, you now it's very long history that is very hard to encapsulate in these ideas of relationship between languages, which is now so fraught for the politics because it's all well, whose land is it? You can't say the direct, it's all the direct land because we're, and so you're getting into fraught territory. Um, yeah, you mentioned the language needs contact with other living languages to maintain otherwise a fixed pronunciation. I wonder if you could expand specifically why this is important and how this would have theoretically affected the language. Right, sorry, I, probably didn't context that well. I, I had a flow, but my flow got a bit disjointed with the slides, didn't quite match the flow, is that with, and, uh, oh, I should have go back to the Creole too. With the, um, with, when we're reclaiming a language from the written format, we don't have the pronunciation. And like I keep doing the English rather than the Europe, a uh, long vowel. So we will say things wrong. And um, Richard was told that NG comes from sing. Ing, sing. So it's ing and ya, and it's not, it's ing ya. So it's, it's got the e, you know, it's, which has gone on because of the way we're taught from the written. So it becomes a different. So it was more actually in the reclama reclamation that this problem became that we didn't have spoken languages around us to say, oh, that's how you pronounce it. But so things like the, the, I think the, I forgot the name, the language um, in, Newca in um, Armadale is. Uh, very, again, a lot of it's been lost because a lot of settlers moved to Armadale and cleared the area of local speakers and their right to speak. And the, they've noticed that I think it's Gimleroy, which is lo, lo, close, has very similar words, but the, their, their version misses the first syllable of the Gimleroy word. So they're saying, well, right, we'll take some Gimleroy words and, and adapt it to our language. So this way of adapting from local languages isn't so easy with, for the Darug. And just the reason why I was bringing in the Creole is because I'm now working in the Northern Territory. We're working a lot with languages that have become Creole. And well, what was spoken is Creole. And often the tr pure tradition language isn't spoken. But um, my understanding is because we don't have the language. If you're walking, 
as, as I think one of the previous speakers was saying, you, you need the context where you've got to and now instead of, you, instead of deciding what language you use in this context, you, have, you want to use one language. So you want the language to supply all contexts. I think it was over the Irish. So you're walking around the street and you see a motor car, motor car. So you might put an Aboriginal accent on it, but you're going to have to use the English word. So it becomes a Creole because you don't have the language for the environment that you're working. Anawan, yeah, that's right. So uh, yeah, Anawan, I knew began of A. <laughs> Thank you, Chucky. Anawan or Nyanyanwarin. Nyanyanwarin, Wanyan, Wanyan. That's, um, yeah, their language was very much decimated, but it's linked to Gamilaroi so they could reclaim Anawan from that low neighboring language. And so, yeah, and on one thing too, I have to acknowledge, um, uh, Zimmerman, I forgot his name, the Hebrew fella who came and talked and he said, Zuckerman. 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 Oh, sorry. Um, I got there. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> he greeted. Um, he came and he said, if you're going to reclaim a language that is not spoken, if you're going to totally re re revive a language, you've got to be mad. And yep, Richard's mad and I've got quite a lot of madness and yep, you've just got to be. And thank you, Jackie, for uh, um, accepting that <laughs> craziness that we have to actually believe that we can do this for a language, yeah. So any more questions? Any more questions in there? I, I, Kat, I was just wondering about your reference to Creole. Were you saying that um, you have a sense and Richard has a sense that um, the Creole languages of Australia have influenced um, Daruk or did you mean that the, um, the contact language that developed around the Sydney area, Pigeon, that I wrote about too in my doctoral work, that that, that has influenced um, Daruk, I, I wasn't quite understanding what you were saying. About no, I was, I was more saying the, that the language is surviving as a pigeon. So when, oh, when, when no, they survive, no. yeah. So now okay. they exist as a pigeon. And, and that's actually, part, I didn't actually mention that, was when, when, obviously when Richard in 1960s was listening to his aunties speak, it was a pigeon. It was like very scattered words. So there wasn't, he wasn't provided with the full language, but it just gave him a flavor of, hey, there is this language, it's different. It's got different words for different things and different emphasis. And one thing too, also, which was interesting because they were his aunties, when he speaks, he often practically sings in a high voice. And I used to be very confused about why Richard sang in a high voice. Well, he's imitating the high voices of his aunties. So yeah, it's, odd influence on, <laughs> on the language reclamation but yeah so it's more that and particularly working up here a lot of the languages are becoming creole because of that same need to survive in an english environment yeah great well thank you so much kat for that wonderful talk so we'll give a virtual thank round you of very much here for that um so thank you again